Hey readers and writers, I'm Adrian Buskey, and you're listening to Fictitious, a podcast about the storytelling craft of science fiction and fantasy. This is my first episode of 2019, and it kicks off Fictitious Season 3. To get the new year started, I wanted to share one of my all-time favorite live panel discussions. Ten Points to Slytherin, Why Good Fans Love Evil Characters, was recorded at San Diego Comic-Con in the summer of 2017. Joining me on the Comic-Con stage was an amazing lineup of writers across fiction, television, comics, and geek journalism, featuring superstar TV scribe Jane Espenson, Marvel's Cloak & Dagger co-executive producer Christine Boylan, young adult breakout author Tomi Adeyemi, Marvel and DC Comics writer Erica Schultz, best-selling paranormal romance author Rebecca Zanetti, and Nerdist and Geek & Sundry writer Kendall Ashley. If you're interested in what makes a great villain so compelling and captivating, you'll find a lot of ideas to explore in this discussion. But more than anything, this panel is just really, really fun. It was recorded in front of a full-to-capacity, late-night, rowdy Comic-Con crowd who definitely came to play. And so did our panelists. So, up front, here's a warning. There's a fair amount of good-natured swearing in this episode, including emphatic F-bombs and what movie ratings would probably call adult themes. This is probably not one to listen to with your kids. Another heads up, this was recorded in July of 2017, before the release of many recent popular films and books, and, notably, ahead of the Kevin Spacey scandals that have changed any discussions of the Netflix series House of Cards and his villainous main character. So please keep that timing in mind while listening. After the panel, stick around for some more info about Fictitious Season 3, but for now, enjoy 10 Points to Slytherin, Why Good Fans Love Evil Characters. <laughs> But I want to make sure that everybody is here for 10 Points to Slytherin, Why Good Fans Love Evil Characters. Yeah. Great name. Uh, Great name. Unless there's some of you who are here that are just tired and sweaty and want to put at your feet up for a little while. Also, but this room is an air conditioner. Totally like acceptable. To Either one of those is all good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you all for uh, braving Comic Con after dark. <laughs> Does that give us permission to get like. Rowdy. Really rowdy, yes. 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 saucy. <laughs> Does anybody in here care if we use some colorful language? <laughs> <laughs> some some people expect baby. it. <laughs> <laughs> the baby says it's okay. The baby's okay with that. <laughs> the baby's oh, yes, first then. word is going to be fuck, and it's going to be all your fault. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we're just contributing to the delinquency of minors. I think that's a completely admirable. Uh, but for this panel, yeah. I mean, if you thought you were going to come to this thing and get some well-disciplined, principled, lawful, good, alignment Hello. kinds of crap, you were in the wrong place. We're going to go to the bad place tonight. So like I said, this is 10 points to Slytherin. Um, you don't have to be a Slytherin to participate. I'm a proud Griffin Claw. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's fair. Okay. I mean, I will boldly say, well, actually, because that's how the Griffin Claws work, right? But, um, but at the same time, if I was going to say, you know, look at the X-Men universe who I identified with, for me, it would be Magneto. Yes. And or just me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, you know, everybody has a dark side, and that's what we kind of wanted to talk about tonight. So... Really quickly, uh, my name is Adrian Buskey. I am the host of the Nerd for Living family of podcasts for The Ambitious Nerd. And uh, in particular, I think the one that would be uh, interesting to you guys is Fictitious, which is all about writing and genre storytelling. So if you like hearing people talk about writing and creating and making awesome villains, um, that show might be right up your alley. Um, but enough about my crap. Let's talk about their crap. Um, <laughs> I'm going to start uh, right down here with... Um, Jane Espenson, yeah. right? <laughs> I mean, I suppose you should introduce yourself and talk about the stuff you do. I mean, you, you guys probably know, right? Like, a little bit? Yeah. Okay, I'm Jane. I've written for stuff that you like, I think. Um, Buffy and Angel and Firefly and Battlestar Galactica and Gilmore Girls and the OC and Game of Thrones and Once Upon a Time and a few other things in there, too. And I'm very happy to be here. <laughs> Yeah. Go. Go. Yeah. Right on. Uh, yeah. Oh, I'm Jane's friend, Christine. Um, <laughs> that's the best. Uh, I'm Christine Boylan. I've worked on things like 
Castle, Once Upon a Time, Leverage, uh, other things, Constantine. I'm currently working for Marvel. I can't tell you what shows. You can guess. I will not change my expression and acknowledge a um, bunch of comic books and uh, some original short films and stuff as well. And I was sorted into House Slytherin, so I feel like it's okay. To be- I think it's okay. Yeah, yeah. It's okay. I still like you, Christine. <laughs> we can be friends. Um, I'm Kendall Ashley. I write for Nerdist and Geek and Sundry, and I too am sorted Slytherin. <laughs> she gets kept it nice and brief. Oh, that's super brief. <laughs> I'm Rebecca Zanetti. I write uh, dark paranormals and romantic suspense. Um, my 35th book comes out August 1st. Um, yeah. oh, I like words. <laughs> she has more books than some of you are old. <laughs> I'm in Hufflepuff. Uh, <laughs> don't be disappointed. Okay. I wear cardigans. <laughs> uh, I'm Erica Schultz. I'm a comic book writer. I've written for Marvel DC, uh, Hawk Girl for DC, Revenge for Marvel. Uh, I have a creator owned series called M3. And uh, I think I did it like years ago, and I might have been a Ravenclaw, so I'm not entirely sure. <laughs> And hi, I'm Tomi Adiemi. My first book, Children of Blood and Bone, comes out next March. And, and uh, the movie is in development at Fox, so that is cool. And Pottermore sorted me into Ravenclaw. Yeah. <laughs> but BuzzFeed told me I had heavy Slytherin leanings, so I'm a, a, a Slitherclaw. Slither-claw. You come over for coffee. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> good. Well, um, I want to point out over here, so I've got everybody's names and their faces and their Twitter accounts so that you can hold them accountable for any shit that they say on stage uh, today. Uh, so if it's good and it's juicy, please tweet it and tag them and let it all uh, share in that. So the first thing I want to ask is, who is your favorite villain? Like from any property, any medium, anything, like what's the one that you most connect to? I'm going to start back down the end and then come back down. So tell me you can oh, take okay. it. So for me, it's easy. It's Magneto, and it's because I don't think he's a villain. And it's not one of those, oh, he's misunderstood. I think every time I write a villain, I try and model it after Magneto because the, they always say the villain is the hero of his own story. And yeah. I feel with Magneto, he's like, he's right because he lived through the Holocaust. So he yes. saw humanity turn on humans. And now you go, I don't, I'm not good with math. So let's say 50 years, don't, I don't know. I don't do math, right? <laughs> um, but then you go to the future. And now, like, there's a different species. So when he says humanity's never going to accept us and he has this Holocaust tattoo, you don't get to say, no, Magneto, peace. So (laughs) I like him because I'm like, I am always on his side. So that's what I always want to feel. Those are my favorite villains when you can really, like, ethically get behind them because that is so much more compelling to me than just someone that's like, I want to smash things. (laughs) Uh, I like it when it's paired together, like, ethically can like, get on board with you smashing things. Yeah. <laughs> I would say my favorite villain, even though she's a hero now, is Rogue, because when she mm-hmm. first came on the scene, she was part of the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants, and um, she touches the wrong person. She gets kind of wacky and screwed up, so she's also, you know, she deals with a lot of personal issues in terms of, like, intimacy issues and, you know, who can I trust and things like that, and I think that makes her a very interesting character. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to go with Darla from Angel. Um, I like her backstory. Uh, you know, I mean, she, she started at a time when, you know, it was rough for women. She was a prostitute. She got sick. She was going to die. She became a vampire. She turned angel. And then they had this great run of pillaging and, and fun. And then he killed her for the hot, younger, blonde va- <laughs> vampire <laughs> slayer cheer- cheerleader. And then she came back. And everything she did was to try to get that time back with him. And in the end, she sacrificed herself. So there was always hope for Darla. And that's why I liked her and still do. Um, I really liked uh, the governor from The Walking Dead. Um, He just, I I loved, and I mean, I know everyone wasn't a huge fan of when they kind of gave you a bit of his backstory and you got to learn a bit more about him as a person. But that almost made me not like him, like, yeah, go governor, chop Herschel's head off. No, that's not <laughs> bad governor. But it made it more of a dynamic guy than just like, whoa, here's a crazy guy with an eye patch in a closet full of walker heads. Um, he was just perfectly evil, and I enjoyed him. 
Um, I'm also a Magneto person, and my husband has to sit through endless sort of like tirades about like, <laughs> he's completely justified in everything he's doing, no matter what. But um, I, I will talk about Loki for a second, because, you know, why not? Uh, what I do like about those, especially in the films, the, uh, and I think I'm going to give Kenneth Branagh some credit <laughs> for this, is sort of connecting the villain and the sort of hero villain archetypes to like, Shakespearean, you know, the, the Shakespearean version of them. So, like, it's straight up King Lear, and I think it's great. I think the movie version of Loki is fantastic. So that's my my new jam, my recent jam. Uh, I love a villain with an evil plan, but I also like just a really identifiable villain that points out the villainy in real life. So I'm going to go with Gaius Baltar yes. from Battlestar Galactica yes. because he's just so human. He's so weak, and he just makes bad decisions and justifies them with this inflated view of himself that is just so human. It makes you realize like the most evil thing in the world can come from just a person who can't resist a moment of temptation and, and doesn't have a big plan. Um, so yeah, and, and he's funny. <laughs> and adorable. And very cute. Yeah. <laughs> so those are your favorites, but are there particular villains that you feel a kinship to beyond what you kind of talked about that maybe you like, you look on screen and you're like, oh, that's bad me. <laughs> or that like, whether it's their personal background or their just their general personality or their motivation in some way where you look like, oh, if I, you know, flipped from hero to heel, like that's kind of who I'd be. Yeah, the, the villain I think that's most like me is the one you see a lot in sitcoms that's really like oh my God. a little judgy and snotty and officious. <laughs> and so earlier this evening, I told Christine that I was doing a lot of preparing for this panel and she should probably do some preparing because I was going to be really prepared. <laughs> <laughs> and then she, yeah, then she like panicked and did a bunch of preparing. Yeah. And I yeah. got to laugh. <laughs> <laughs> Boo. <laughs> so anti-hero me is definitely Jessica Jones, or maybe not anti-hero me. It's just if you saw me trying to stumble into the Marriott elevators earlier, like <laughs> it was literally the clip from the Defenders was me just stumbling in you know, with a coffee and booze. But um, but on the Jessica Jones tip, I like okay. So we were watching it, and I'm sort of sitting there going, Kilgrave, I get it. And my husband was like, what? <laughs> and I was like, look, I get it. Like, I, I see it. Like, if I had those powers, I might, you know, try that. I may, like, stop doing it eventually, but I might make people just, you know, do whatever I wanted them to. So that was a kind of a moment of, like, I never felt that in the comics, but watching the show, I thought, yeah, I might do that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Scary, right? Yeah. <laughs> Um, I had kind of a similar moment with my husband when we were watching The Walking Dead, um, and it was after Shane kind of, my, my things are very zombie related right now, but um, it was after Shane kind of turned into like evil Shane, um, and just started doing, letting people go to the walker so he can get the supplies back to keep Carl safe, and um, saying that Rick was too weak and so trying to kill him, and all these kinds of different things. Spoiler alert, it's... It was a long time ago, so hopefully you guys are all caught up. <laughs> you know, I was watching it with my husband and a couple of our friends, and they were like, oh, my gosh, I just, I can't believe Shane would do that. Like, what a monster. And I was like, mm. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I get it. I get it. Like, it's, it's the zombie apocalypse, y'all. Like, I mean, you got to, you have to make some hard choices when people are literally eating your face. And so I think, which is probably why I'm sort of slithering of that, like, cunning ambitious thing because I'm just like I've got to like I've got to keep my people safe and but yeah so none of my friends want to like be on my zombie apocalypse team so, <laughs> so translated you totally killed somebody in high school right um, I thought this was a really hard question because I ended up identifying with so many villains and I had no idea <laughs> about myself. You know, the one I, I chose for the answer would be Harley Quinn because um, I was, you know, I have several degrees also and I always fell for the wrong guy. I always picked the wrong guy and she chose the wrong guy. And then he, ch you know, he changed her. So I was able to grow up and get older and choose the right guy. And she never had that chance, but I think she still can. I, th I think there's still hope for her. I think she chose the right girl in yeah. Poison Ivy. Oh. Yeah. And maybe that's it, yeah. But she still loves, you know, Joker. 
All right, first I have to say that It's the Apocalypse, y'all, is now my new battle cry. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> and she says it's so cute, it's the Apocalypse, y'all. <laughs> um, I would say if I had to pick a villain, it would be Dark Phoenix, because there are days I just want to burn the fucking world to the ground. <laughs> and, you know, and just start over. Mm-hmm. Like, let's everybody go back to the white hot room and just <laughs> everybody start over. So Dark Phoenix. So that, that's how I feel every time I open Twitter, really. Yes. 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 Burn yes. it down! Burn it down. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm, I'm really resonating with that right now because literally <laughs> last night I was really mad about something on Twitter and I was talking to my boyfriend on the phone. I was like, I'm just going to burn the world down with my yes. book and we'll rebuild from the ashes. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe it's um, Dark Phoenix, but the one I had that I like kind of popped halfway through was Light Yagami from Death Note. Um, and if you don't know Death, I th- we should because we're nerds. But if you don't know Death Note, um, he's a teenager who gets this book where you can write a name and kill anyone. And he takes on this like crusade of killing all the criminals and erasing crime from the world and like rebuilding a new world. And like at least twice a week, I see something on the news and I'm like, if I had the book. And then I go through this whole thing and I'm like, oh, do I want to damn my soul for eternity? But I was like, but I could really do it. And then I was like, oh, and I could make this person die this way. And it would be vengeance. So I think about these things a lot. And so I only do fiction, but I think that, like, I, I think about having a death note a lot. So that's my guy. Death note dude, like, writes names in it. Tommy's in there drawing fucking portraits. I'm going to get the detail right on this. <laughs> you are scary. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like I'm with my people. Yeah. <laughs> I like you guys. Uh-huh. So, obviously, we got a room full of people that I'm going to make the blanket assumption, which is probably wrong, that you're all good folks, but you like the bad guys. But at some point, it had to be something that, that like, fandoms had to develop out where they could say, oh, we can like the bad guy in something. And I just want to open this to anybody who wants to jump on the mic, but like, who do you think broke that open? Is there like, are there specific characters, you know, going back to the beginning of fiction? Um, <laughs> that's very Ravenclaw of me. Let's like <laughs> dig into the history books. Um, but you know, that, that we can look at and say, oh, this, this is maybe the character where it started, where people said, I kind of like that bad guy better than that douchey hero dude. Or whoever, you know. Well, like Falstaff wasn't a bad guy, but right. he was just an ass. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He's I mean, your drunk friend. You want to hang out with him? Yeah. <laughs> but, but he wasn't like a good person, but he was just like the drunk idiot that everybody just was like, hey, let's go hang out with him, buy him a few pints, and watch him make an ass out of himself. Yes. Mm-hmm. And Let- this, this doesn't go as far back as that, but the first line of Moby Dick is Call Me Ishmael. But does anyone do you ever think that's a book about Ishmael? It's a book about Ahab. Exactly. Yeah. He's a much more interesting guy. Yeah. yeah. And, and the author. Mm-hmm. knew that but like you know satan has all the best lines mm-hmm. you know yes. i mean milton no i was just gonna say bad guys have fun so they're yeah. bad guys yeah. have fun but they don't yeah. have they don't have these moral constraints that have to make you all tortured well mm-hmm. and they make you complicit i mean in the shakespearean tradition like it is it is a reaching out and like come on everybody don't you want to like fuck with these people let's do it yeah. Yeah. Like, and you're like yeah let's do well, it and they're funny you know there's humor there that mm-hmm. makes them likable i don't think there was the beginning because it was so recent but like frank underwood Oh yeah, I feel like that was the like not just an anti-hero being in the lead, but like a true villain. Mm. Yeah, and mm-hmm. you're just re- like you want to see him burn Washington. There's a lot of burning <laughs> things, <Yeah. laughs> but it's like watching him and Claire like tear through every person in their path, and like seeing that they will like lie to anyone, they will kill anyone, they will yeah. do that, will like mm. sleep with everyone like together. It's like a thing. To me, that was the first like true villain on TV, not an anti-hero as the protagonist, mm-hmm. but like a true villain mm-hmm. that like everyone was rallying around because they're like, wow, how can someone be so dark mm-hmm. and like so unabashedly like I'm gonna take everyone out all the way up to the president. Mm-hmm. You know who I also thought recently, because you just said Frank Underwood was Cotton mouth from yes. yes. When they killed him oh. off in in episode, I think it was like episode six or seven. I stopped watching because it stopped being interesting. He's so he was vibrant. so classy and like the way they framed him and he was like in front of the Biggie poster. Oh my uh-huh. God. Like it was just so well done and he was just. I mean, he, obviously he won an Oscar because he's an amazing actor, but he was just so phenomenal as a character and you. 
even though it's like, man, this guy is killing people and he's selling all these drugs and he's selling all these guns and he's mm-hmm. gotta be like a really bad person. He's so fucking cool. Oh my God. Yeah. He has the soul of a poet and that flashback yes. episode yes. is my favorite episode of the whole series. Yes. yes. Oh and, he, and, and every once in a while he would just get on the harp and just yes. play yes. and it would be like, everything's fine. And then it was like, no, we're gonna kill this motherfucker right now. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. You know? mm-hmm. I wonder if the case could be made that villains are just a better fit for drama because so the hero mm-hmm. has to preserve the status quo generally right. and that's not proactive you always want a proactive protagonist mm-hmm. so the villain actually can have a goal right mm-hmm. um, that what if a protagonist is already in a functioning society there's not much for them to do actively except wait yeah. for the bad guy to make that first move so yeah. and also the hero's not as interesting if it's if there's nothing bad in the world. Like, the right. only way that, like, if everything was even keel, there would be no good or no bad. So right. you have to have something bad for the hero to elevate. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. Or it's even like, like, if there was no Lex Luthor or any of the villains, Superman would just be flying around stopping people from jaywalking or something. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, Lex yeah. is great. Or, like, good. Or rescuing people from burning <laughs> buildings or cats from trees. Yeah. Right, yeah. yes. Yeah. I mean, and honestly, if you thought about it, who would you rather hang out with? I mean, yeah, Lex Superman's has got all the money. Whatever, but, but. <laughs> Lex has all the money. He has yeah, yeah. All yeah, he owns yeah. the club you're hanging out in. So right. Soups ain't making it rain with shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we hit on uh, some things there that go into this next question, but um, I want to talk about the anatomy of a villain. Not Good specifically <laughs> a great yes. set of abs or piercing <laughs> eyes. <laughs> Although those are good too, <laughs> it helps. I mean, they tend to have cheeks. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, it's like I mean, watching. Man, it's, it's like watching crazy. once and seeing Regina. You know, yes. I, who can get it? Let's just be honest <laughs> here, right? So, um, or a Loki, right? Yes. Yes. Who can get it? Loki can get it. <laughs> uh, what are the pieces that go together to create a great villain? Like, what are, like, those, I mean, you kind of touched on a few of them here and there, but, like, if we're assembling the ultimate fantastic villain, what are the pieces that need to be a part of it? Childhood trauma helps. Yes. They need to be relatable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They need to be vulnerable. I mean, well, would you like Thor to be your brother? I mean, really? Oh, right. Okay. I mean, no. can you imagine oh my gosh. up with, you know. I'd cut his hair while he slept. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and hide his hammer. I you really can't, like. You can't lift it. There's got to be a way. <laughs> and if that was my brother, I would figure out a way to hide that hammer. Just like, he doesn't, he's not very bright. You just like cover it with a sheet. And I'm sure he's <laughs> 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 <I'm> honest. <laughs> I also really like a villain that you can, when you watch them go on their journey, you understand why they're doing it. Yeah. Maybe mm-hmm. you're like, yes, I do the exact same thing. Maybe you wouldn't, but it's not like, I'm just going to kill the world because I am evil guy. You know, like when we watched Walter White on Breaking Bad turn in from like this chemistry teacher to this big bad drug lord. And you kind of go like, oh yeah, I got it. You know, and in that moment when he doesn't save Jane from ODing, you're like, you know (laughs) that that kind of where you can really like follow their emotions and follow their journey and it makes sense as opposed to just I'm gonna monologue at the end and like retcon everything do you understand (laughs) that's that's good yeah and that that motivating thing or that that childhood trauma is unfairness as a core element I think because then no matter what they do you know that in their mind they're just trying to get back to even Mm -hmm. from having been treated unfairly which makes them very that's part of what makes them so likable Mm -hmm. is that we're all supposed to be on the side of fairness right and this is this might be i don't know if this is basic or not but the idea of like the hero is trying to get justice the villain is trying to get revenge often and it's Mm -hmm. the same unfairness right Mm -hmm. i mean the, the maybe the heroes had the same unfairness and they're like, oh, we've got to, you know, even out justice for everybody. And the villain's like, no, I want what's mine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, give me that. That's that's just not fair. And we've had lots of talks about Regina. I mean, yeah. she's someone I related to from jump because she felt that the world was dealing her a bad hand. She was going to go out and change those cards. And yeah. to me, that's like the most proactive, fun character to write. Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. Do you think there's something to um, the idea of that the, the villain not only wants what's theirs, but there, there's an escalation? You know, because it's like once they actually get into the act of wanting to get that thing, Mm -hmm. then they discover that kind of living without rules opens up the boundaries. And they're like, but I could have more. That's the the Kilgrave problem. Right. 
and, and like when he tries to, to use his power for good, it's so uncomfortable because <laughs> like, yeah. he never thought of it, <laughs> you know, it just didn't occur to him. Mm -hmm. um, the idea of like, oh, I could have a little bit, I could have more, I could have more, I could have more. And I guess there, there are no limits. I mean, some of the best villains do have limits and focus. I think if we go back to like Iago or whatever, it's like, I'm just going to ruin that guy's life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm not going to ruin Cassio, the guy who got my job. I'm going to ruin the guy who gave him the job because he's beautiful and perfect and has a beautiful wife. I'm going to ruin that because I can't have that. Yeah, I like that, the, the razor focus of like, I'm not going to be unfair to everyone. I'm just going to get, I'm going to do what I see as fair and get mine. Mm -hmm. um, but, I mean, we also like ambition. I mean, yes. that's, that's what's funny in Austin Powers when Dr. Evil asks for $1 million. <laughs> <laughs> like, but you, like, no one has to have better ambition. <laughs> you know what's funny? What I find interesting is you guys are talking about this idea of being wronged, whether it's childhood trauma or whatever. Sometimes it's not the hero themselves that, you know, like in The Incredibles, it was when Mr. Incredible sort of told Syndrome to piss off as a kid, mm -hmm. Incredible Boy, and told him to piss off that then that created the villain. But sometimes it's not even that simple. Sometimes it's there's something about this hero mm -hmm. that I'm going to put all my baggage on them. Like with it, with the exception of the whole Lex Luthor um, when he got kryptonite cancer or whatever, that storyline, like there was nothing that Soups actually did to Lex. It was just the fact that Lex was basically anti-alien, mm. you know, and he put all his baggage on Superman. And I think it was also probably a jealousy thing because, like, let, you know, he had hair. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you know, there's an interesting thing there with, like, with Lex and Superman because Superman, like, Lex has everything. Like, literally except everything. Hair. But, <laughs> except hair. Except hair. But he's still human. He has every human power you can possibly have, and he's the smartest guy in the room. He's much smarter than Superman. Um, but Superman is still this idyllic, perfect specimen of a creature. And I, I always just wonder if, if there's like that one little thing in the back of Lex's uh, head that's just like, if I just stomp that one guy into the ground, I have proven my moral superiority definitively. And it feels like he's the kind of guy that like he wants to everybody to know, no, I'm, I'm the guy. Like, well, it's like when one. you go to prison, they say, be the shit out of the biggest guy in the room, mm -hmm. or at least start a fight with him, because then nobody's going to fuck with you. And right. that's basically what it is. It's like Superman is the most powerful person on this planet. If I take this guy down, nobody's going to screw with me because I took Superman down. Right. Well, what about the, the things that draw the fans in the most, too? And I, I think we're you know, thinking here of things like aesthetic style, like, right? Yeah. Like humor, it on, it Does it depend on who the actor is that yeah. they, yeah. they yeah. can I mean, That, that helps, can be a piece right? of it, yeah. yeah. But even like in fiction, I mean, you can go back and read Moriarty. Mm -hmm. You're yeah. like, uh -huh. man, Moriarty's got some style, right? right. And like <laughs> when performed well, like it's it's a magnetic yeah. character that you, that you want to get behind because you're like, wow, that might be the dude I want to put my money on because he's the smartest guy in the room. You know, like that kind of thing, you think about like, well, you know, you go to Comic-Con and you see the visuals of the character. Have you guys seen the the, the Hela walking yes, around? Yes, yes. No. Uh, she's got the headpiece with it, it comes out to here, you know? And Amazing. I mean, she's not Kate Blanchett, but she's doing a pretty fucking good job yeah. of trying. Right? I would follow her anywhere. Right. I kind of did follow her for like a little while. Yeah. But she's beautiful. Yeah, I was like going down an escalator the opposite side, and I was like, I need to go that side. That's that's who's team I mean, and, and what? I mean, we don't know her yet, like you know, because we haven't seen the film. But if you get the preview, and she grabs the hammer, you know, which is there's some metaphor here, I, was I say, think, that. right? <laughs> yeah, you know, it's like because I mean, well, Captain Hammer said himself, the hammer's my penis, yeah, um, my and Hell is just like <laughs> bullshit. Oh, that's a villain we love. Uh, Yo, Dr. Yeah. Horrible. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, my God. Mm -hmm. He did He's it. the most huggable, Salt. lovable. <laughs> yeah, we've, we've gotten to the core of it. Oh Dr. Horrible's <laughs> sing-along <laughs> blog. From now on, for the rest of this panel, it's all a musical. Jane goes next. <laughs> <laughs> but isn't that the sort of the idea that, that in a way, and this, I don't know if this is controversial or not, but the idea that the villain is the thinking man's hero. Mm -hmm. That is sure. kind of a thing. I mean, Aaron Burr, Salieri... And Dr. Horrible, <laughs> the, the trifecta, you guys. But, but the idea that that is the smartest guy in the room. Moriarty is the smart. He's slightly smarter than Sherlock at the pivotal moments. And you're like, oh, that is sexier. 
I'm, and I think I, I want to keep coming back to humor because I think humor is how you can quickly, in a script, indicate intelligence. Yeah, it's a lot easier than having them do math. Right. Uh, just have if a care, you have to be smart to make a joke. And, yeah. it, and in a script, you have the luxury of making them as fast as you want because mm -hmm. you can take all the time you want to think of the jokes they are going to come up with in an instant. <laughs> right. And yeah. so if you think of the difference between why is Angelus different than Angel, mm -hmm. Angel could be kind of a drag. He's kind of a little mopey. And, and, but mm -hmm. Angelus, what, if you talk, just looking at them physically, what makes them different? Angelus is smirking. Angelus <laughs> is, is amused. Mm -hmm. And it makes him smarter and more interesting. Mm -hmm. I mean, like Lucifer himself, I mean, pretty much the evilest character I guess you're supposed to be. Um, in Supernatural and Lucifer, the show, he's very smart. And in Supernatural, he's super funny. He's really funny in, in Lucifer as well. But it's in a way that is relatable to you. And it's, you know, he's, he's magnetic. And um, I, I think it's fascinating how there's a whole show where essentially – the father of all evil is supposed to be the guy that you're rooting for. And you do because he's so great. And he's so, and Tom Ellis is also very attractive. That's very helpful. Um, but, I interviewed him today. He's very attractive. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's, he's, they're quick witted and they, they make you laugh and they are sure of themselves as well. And that's, a lot of times the heroes are a little more unsteady because they're trying so hard to do the right thing and to be these good things. And yeah, he's like, yeah, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. But then, like Beauty and the Beast, the humor makes the villain, I guess, attractive sometimes. <laughs> sometimes the things where we go like, like, oh, the Beast was so attractive. Well, sort of, but he was also sort of a big bison. Right. Um, <laughs> he is, he is a big bison. <laughs> <laughs> because of the qualities that, we, that he has. Yeah. But that's interesting because, like, if you think about The Little Mermaid, there's a moment when you're, this might be a gender thing, I don't know, it, it, when you're sort of a little girl, or maybe this is true for guys too, and you're watching those Disney movies and you're like, wait, oh, uh, Ursula's making a lot of sense. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Don't sign that contract. But she's really smart. Maybe study law with her because <laughs> she knows what she's talking about. I want her as my agent, right? You know? I mean, that is yeah. that's the agent you want. Yes. Yeah. You want to yeah. sign with Ursula. But like, yeah. she does make a lot of sense, you know? Yeah. And, and there's a certain moment when you're growing up, you're like, oh, okay, so what does it mean? I mean, there's a, a lot of great stuff online that is written about like The Little Mermaid as a test case for what is the idea of the feminine, uh, you know? And what is the idea of the womanly versus the childish girlishness, right, of The Little Mermaid? But Ursula represents like terrifying womanhood, you know, and and uh, just being really sure of yourself, and that is terrifying, mm -hmm. and also attractive. Mm -hmm. So, yay yeah, Ursula! Yeah. I feel like in young adult literature, the pattern is the dark evil person has to be hot so that there's tension for like, oh, I hate you, but I also want to make out with you. And then you carry that over three books. I feel like it's young adult literature in the CW where yes. like aesthetically <laughs> yes. your villain has to be really hot because yeah. that's 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 what the reader, that's what the viewer wants. Yeah. Well, it's like um, the temptation yeah. aspect. Yeah, because everyone's like humor and quick wit and yeah, was, yeah, but like hot. Like if you're, <laughs> if you're evil and hot, then we... It's, it says a lot about society, but we give you more of a pass than mm -hmm. if you're... Uh, I know there was some stuff about Wonder Woman and people being upset about how, like, Dr. Poison was disfigured, and they were like, that's stereotypical evil, and they were going back to, like, you portray people with disabilities as evil, and I was mm -hmm. thinking about that critically, and I was like, oh, yeah, like, it's either, it's either, like, the really hot person or, like, the really disfigured person, mm -hmm. and I feel like there has to be... Maybe that's why I like Frank Underwood so much, because mm -hmm. I was like, you're not, like, really hot or disfigured, you're just... He's just human, a and you're yeah. doing what you want to do at the expense of everyone else. So I feel like that's the, I don't know. This is more about what we should value as a society, <laughs> like yeah. what we do as villains. <laughs> yeah, I could say in, in Wonder yeah. Woman, David Thewlis's Aries looks like you're an accountant. <laughs> you're the world. So I mean, maybe they hit the middle ground oh, kind of right there, like just a right. little bit. But it's like I mean, yeah, there's that show Time After Time, oh, yeah. where it has. Jack Too the Ripper, yeah. and he's like, oh, oh, yeah. Jack the Ripper's totally fuckable, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, what? Mm -hmm. what? Look, it was yeah. the 1880s. If you had clean water, somebody would want to fuck you too, all right? <laughs> <laughs> but at what writer's room where they were like, hey guys, I know that he butchered prostitutes like really viciously, but what if he was like, 
really bangable, right? <laughs> <laughs> but that is interesting. Like, like yeah, <laughs> first of all, every writer's room, yeah. But like having done some research on Jack Ripper for a project that failed, but um, the, the Victorian idea of if you were good looking, you were good. That's a real fucking thing. Yeah. And that's crazy. Well, the idea of if you, if you had money, you were blessed. That's right. right. My grandmother that's still crazy. thinks that shit, and she's from the old country. Yeah. So. Crazy. Well, and that's how um, more contemporary serial killer, the one who would like, he'd have his arm Hannibal? cast in the... Uh, Bundy? Oh. Bundy? Bundy. Oh, Bundy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Bundy was fucking blonde. Yeah. And, and the, the girls would like... <laughs> <laughs> That's going on. The there's there's the tr- okay. <laughs> so At Jane Espenson. <laughs> Bundy was fuckable, Dahmer was not. <laughs> Such a good bite size quote. <laughs> wait, wait, is this gonna be a Mary Do Kill serial killer edition? Yes. <laughs> We're gonna save that for the audience interaction. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I wanna talk about here uh, how the villain's role in the story improves or amplifies the heroes. You know, like we talked a bit about the the hero can be kind of milk toast if they don't have somebody or they don't have a point to it. Um, or they could be like half the Marvel heroes and just be douchebag with dicks that need somebody to put them in their place. A couple but hot douchebag dicks. Right. Very hot. Super hot douchebag dicks. <laughs> <laughs> Will you do that again? Do that voice, <laughs> on, the, do that voice on the next podcast. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit more about how the villains amplify the hero. Wow. Let's never do that again. That feels yeah. so I mean, I'm like a huge Venture Brothers fan. And like, yes, yes. yes, yes. Just, I'm just going to fangirl about it. But to me, like, the monarch is the hero of that story. So I, it's funny because I always sort of have to reset. I'm like, no, it's about the kids and, and, and Dr. Venture. But oh, no, it's about the, the monarchs, mm. the two of them. And how they're doing. Yes. <laughs> it's a soap about them. So it's funny how, like, after so many seasons, it just in my head, and when I return to watch it, I'm like, no, 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 no. Yeah, it's about, it's about, they, they shift, the protagonism shifts. I like in Supernatural, there's this, I'm so sorry, I'm a big Supernatural fan. <laughs> I always feel like I have to, like, yes, I know, it's been on for a long time, but I love it, and please don't, don't make me feel badly for it. <laughs> like, We're not judging you, Kendall. <laughs> uh, but Live your truth. Let Thank you. Um, when Sam is dealing with uh, the delusions of Lucifer in his head and kind of trying to sort out what is real, and there's they do a lot of that with Sam when he's when he has the demon blood addiction and just having all these antagonists like literally in his head, um, distorting his reality. Um, I feel like those were the places where we really saw Sam and kind of seeing him decide where he wants his place to be, um, especially with his whole being a, the chosen one to uh, for Yellow Eyes to ruin the world. Um, and so I, I really loved that actual, like, internal conflict that you got to see, um, that it just looked like craziness on the outside. But um, I think that he really made him a lot more dynamic. I yeah. feel like I learned the most about, like, what antagonists have to do from reading books about storytelling. Like, there's this one book... It's called The Anatomy of a Story by John Truby, and it like it, it breaks down a lot about storytelling, which was helpful for like learning how to actually write and finish a book. But it was like the antagonist and the protagonist have to have the same goal. And like and the story has to be the chess match between each of them. Mm-hmm. And like that for me, I was like, oh, the light bulb went off because I was like, the if you don't have them in the same place going head to head to head to head to head, like you said, there's no there's no story. Then it's just someone like then it's just Harry Potter taking his classes, which would still be really fun, but you know, it's like you, I, I would watch that, but you know, like without Voldemort, we don't have the seven books. We just have life as it is. So I feel like that's what in any story, like if you don't have your antagonist and your protagonist going after the same exact thing on the opposite sides of it, you don't really have a story. You don't have a compelling story. That's really interesting because I was just thinking about Everybody Loves Raymond. <laughs> 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 <Very fun>. <laughs> <laughs> it's such okay. a segue. So, so like he's got his mom and he's got his wife, and they both love him and they both want his time and attention, mm-hmm. and he's torn in the middle. Everybody loves Raymond, and so the network note was: we just did a bunch of testing. Turns out audiences don't like the the mom character; they don't like Doris Roberts. We should probably minimize her role in the show. 
and the showrunners are smart enough to go, no, they're not supposed to like it. That's the tension of the show. Mm -hmm. That's the hero and the villain wanting the same thing. You have to have them both. Yeah. If yeah. you get rid of the mom character, what's the wife character going to fight against? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's yeah. And she the turns into the villain. Right. Then yeah. it becomes okay. the, the exactly. villain, you know, naggy wife. Right. 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 Yeah. yeah. The mom is absolutely crucial. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and I love that she yeah. has the same, they have the same role. That's smart. I think also going back to Supernatural, which I also love, is I think you pointed out well that um, the show is a lot more interesting and is when Lucifer is the bad guy versus yeah. somebody like Crowley because you love Crowley. He's yeah. funny. He's running hell, and he's doing a good job running hell. You know, <laughs> you know, he's not bad at it. No, you know, he has people in lines continually going in lines, and he's funny. But he wants to be Dean Winchester's friend so bad right. that the tension isn't there. So you, right. you know, you need you need Lucifer who doesn't want to be Dean's friend no. to make Dean and Sam rise up and be heroes, and it gets more interesting. I think mm -hmm. so. I agree with that. And I liked the mom. The in, in, she reminded me of people I know. <laughs> How healthy do you think it uh, think it is for us to explore our understanding of ourselves through villains? So whether it's writing or watching them on the screen and saying, "Okay, I can identify with them," and that that character who can take things to the nth degree in a way that I cannot, but I feel that want or desire to do that. Like, how do you feel about that? As like a soul searching exercise i think as a writer that's something that you yes. have to do mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because y you want to be able to write authentic characters whether it's the the protagonist or your antagonist i mean the the creator owned book that i did called m3 the protagonist is she's an assassin she kills people she is not a morally like on the right of a character you know she kills people and has no you know doesn't give a shit about it but what makes her interesting, or at least I think it makes her interesting, is the fact that she doesn't do this because it's something she wants to do. She does it for money and she gets money and then she gives three quarters of the money away to a charity because it doesn't mean anything to her. Mm -hmm. Because her, you know, her just being alive is enough for her. It's just something she happens to be very good at. You know, and I think that you have to explore villains and I think characters in general whether it's your villain or your hero have to be multi-layered otherwise you get milk toast and you know random people who just want to burn the world for no reason mm -hmm. you know like I, I mean I joke and I just talk about Phoenix but Phoenix wants to burn the world because Phoenix believes that when the world rebuilds it will be better mm -hmm. and so there's a reason behind burning everything to the ground mm -hmm. and there's a lot of freedom in creating and being able to step back and think what if you know, and letting yourself do that. Um, though it does scare the people around you a little bit sometimes. <laughs> you know, my husband and I were watching, um, we were on our deck and we were watching um, the fireworks on 4th of July and there was nobody else around. And I was just thinking out loud and I was like, you know, you could totally shoot somebody right now and nobody <laughs> would know. And he looked around and he goes, we're the only two people here. <laughs> and you just bought a gun. <laughs> so I like the freedom of it, but my husband's not so sure. <laughs> but I do, I think even if you're not, uh, if, you, if you don't do this for a living, if you're an accountant or you like run a shop or you do a perfectly wonderful job and you're a perfectly nice person, it's really good to explore your dark side in a safe mm -hmm. way. Yeah. That's what's great about this. It's like, I love this character. I love that character. I love this villain. If you investigate it and kind of do that work, and whether that involves therapy or journaling or just watching the movie eight times, like whatever it is, you've kind of exercised that part of your nature. Mm -hmm. You've taken it out for a walk in a safe way. You're probably not going to become a serial killer. Probably not. not. You know? Yeah. yeah exactly. I, I heard somewhere that serial killers are people who are very bad at fantasizing and don't dream very vividly and stuff. So they have to go act stuff out. We we get it all out otherwise so yeah. we don't have to We're abduct healthy. people anymore. but that would be the perfect cover <laughs> right <laughs> I feel like that was what was so great about Westworld because it took that Grand Theft Auto like yeah. playing yeah. experience to the next level like mm -hmm. I know for me when I play, it's like, oh, I'm, I'm taking this person's car. And it's right. like, okay, you know, but like, <laughs> it's nice to do that in a safe virtual world. But then with the West world, it's like, you think you're like, 
all right, if I'm here in this Western and there are no consequences, am I really going to like like wash my horse or am I going to go kill robots? And, you know, so I know they have a Westworld exhibit here that was like, oh, you know, so yeah, I think that's, it's like you said, it's like safe exploration yeah. for just the human part of you. And then I think for the writer part of you, like you said, you have to, like for me, I had to root for my villain to write their stuff like, authentically i had to say okay how what's the real world analogy to this oh like a weapon of mass destruction should a weapon of mass destruction come into the world no so now i agree with him so now i can actually make them realistically go up against each other because i think that's when the stories fall flat or they feel very two-dimensional when it's like yeah you have your reason or like someone hit you when you were four but it, it still doesn't justify what you're doing now so yeah, I think you really have to, as a human or a creator, you do have to live out the dark side in your head and hopefully keep it in your head. <laughs> yeah. oh, hopefully. It's villainy with a safe yeah, word, you guys. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Use your safe words. And, and since it all really boils down to being able to see some, something from someone else's point of view, is that exactly what like we're like currently lacking? Like in, yeah. 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 It's nuance. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Are there any characters that you see people cosplay or see them celebrate in the fandom, though, that make you stop and go, that person scares the shit out of me? No, you know, the one the one person that, and I know there's a lot of Harley fans, but I get creeped out when I see little girls dressed as Harley. Yeah. yeah. That creeps me out. Like, I was at um, uh, Palm Springs Comic Con two years ago, and a friend of mine, who I won't mention, he's a voice actor, we were texting each other, we were playing a game, like every time you see a little girl dressed as Harley, you know, the other person gets a punch in the arm kind of thing. Oh. And it was disgusting because it was like, oh my God, all these little girls with the short, you know, little daddy's little monster, you know, fishnet stockings. It was a little creepy, you know, but that's, I, uh, whatever, it's, that's my own issue sorry well, I think there's a, well no but sorry. I mean there's there's essays and there's so much that can be written on the idea uh, on the female side of villainy and what is empowering villainy and what is disempowering villainy yeah mostly I get freaked out by the guys who cosplay as the Joker and never get out of character yeah. they're like walking around the building outside of it and like why is so serious and I'm like I will punch you in the face <laughs> I am large and I will throw you out of here <laughs> Like DJ Jazzy Jeff going out the thing. And now so you're, you're the bad we're guy. Do, we're going to do audience Q&A. We have about four minutes. Really quickly, questions sure. fast. Uh, Crazy Ex-Girlfriend had a uh, number this year, uh, Villain of My Own Story. Yes. Uh, which was amazing. And what it made me realize was, is, or, or the question is, is villainy completely dependent on the point of view? Because she, mm -hmm. and, I, and I love that show, and I want her to get what she wants. Right. Yeah. But she's the villain. She is. Yeah. Yeah, very That's good. It. Good point. And yeah. That's a great example. It can example. be dependent on the point of view, unless you are, you know, abducting and killing people, which is harder to justify. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like, like Javert's not wrong, you know. <laughs> Just saying. But then it's like if you kill the baby Hitler thing, it's right. like yeah. so. I think it's it's always point of view. Yeah, yeah, but you killed someone who's going to murder more people. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, it's like the, the the needs of the many yeah. outweigh the needs of the few. Yeah, mm -hmm. or the baby Hitler. So yes. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> also, great show, Rick. You know? yeah. Yes. Yeah. Totally. Um, so I was just wondering uh, what you guys thought about um, villains who we see go from villainy to anti-hero to hero. It's mm -hmm. sometimes back and forth yeah. like Harley or Spike. Spike. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. People yes. like that. Yeah, love Zuko. Klaus. Yeah. Zuko. It's, it's, so, it's so tempting to make them evolve and become the hero. And so often that removes their edge. Yes. Yep. So one of the things we do on Once Upon a Time is you can never let Regina or Rumpelstiltskin become too sweet and loving and happy because then they lose what makes them interesting. So it's this constant cycling of mm -hmm. what's going to pull them back to the dark. Yeah. It's like what you're saying about Crowley. When he mm. left the whole King Healthy and started to try to be besties with Dean, he was funny. And I mean, Mark Shepard's wonderful. But whenever they're like, oh, we got to kill Crowley, I was like, he's no. fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry about it. He'll be fine. It's also the trouble of uh, making them too sexy is that after a certain point we're like but I, I don't want to bang the bad guy I want to be the good guy yeah Hook, Hook was a villain for like five seconds right yeah, yeah. <laughs> lasted five seconds he's too cute I think we have like a time for one more 
Oh, such Two more. You, uh, you raise your hand first. Yeah, because we'll mine, mine is right. sort yeah, of related to the earlier question about what the future of villainy is. Because you used to be able to, like, you would kill the bad guy and everybody would cheer and the bad guy would die. And now, with the exception of, like, a, a Ramsey Bolton who had to go, oh. Um, oh. You, you have, like, a Rachel Duncan. I mean, people who, they get stabbed, all this stuff happens. And then they, they show up in, like, the next sequence or something. And everybody <laughs> cheers. So can villains die anymore, or is that like something in the past? And now we mm. don't really kill them. It depends them. on what the actor's contract. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, like keep, keep Loki coming back, man. Yeah. <laughs> you know how cute are they? <laughs> one of one of my favorite villains of recent was Tywin Lannister, and I yes. thought I'd never see anyone as cool as him again. But then I got hip to a show called Deadwood. Yes. Yeah. Ian McShane is Al Swearengen. My God. <laughs> he's awesome, and you, you like him, but he's a monster at the same time. Why they canceled that show after season three is beyond me, because <laughs> it's as good as Game of Thrones. Yes, yeah, I agree. <laughs> Deadwood's amazing. <laughs> yeah. well, De uh, that's a great show to study my, for villains uh, and heroes. My freakishly fiendish friends, um, I didn't mean that to be that alliterative, but it works. <laughs> um, this has been a really fun time. I want to thank you guys for coming out late on a Saturday night to party. I want to thank this amazing <laughs> Amazing speakers here. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed this live recording of 10 Points to Slytherin. I do a lot of public speaking and convention panels, and that one was seriously just one of the most fun I've ever moderated. Season 3 of Fictitious is now officially underway, and I can't wait to share the upcoming author interviews with you. In the coming weeks, I'll be talking with Roshni Chakshi, author of The Gilded Wolves, followed by S.A. Chakrabarty, writer of The City of Brass and Kingdom of Copper. And the 2019 book publishing calendar is just chock full of exciting sci-fi and fantasy releases, and I look forward to exploring them with you. This season, I'm also going to try an experiment in this feed. If you follow the show on social or visit the website, you know that I also do written book reviews. New this year, I'll be including audio versions of those reviews as bonus episodes of the podcast. I examine each book as both a reader and from a craft perspective, so I hope you'll find them valuable. I really want your feedback on this new feature, though, so please let me know what you think, either on social media or via the contact form on the website. The home for all things fictitious, including every episode and review, is fictitiouspodcast.com. We're on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook as Fictitious Pod. And you can interact with me directly about books and other nerdy stuff on Twitter where I'm at Adrian Buskey. Since it's the start of a new year and you're working on new habits and positive activities, I'm going to ask you to include just one more. To share and support the stuff you love. Fictitious needs your help to grow and reach more people. You can help by tweeting or posting about the show, sharing our updates, and writing reviews on your favorite podcasting platforms. Word of mouth beats any other kind of marketing, hands down, and your voice and support matters so much. Fictitious is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, and probably a bunch of sites I don't even know about. Listen, subscribe, review us, and catch up on any episodes you might have missed. Let's get 2019 off to a great start. Read more books, write more stories, share the stuff you love, and stay tuned for more Fictitious coming your way next week. 